Good evening and welcome. This is a recording for Wednesday of Holy Week, and it's going to be different. It's going to be different than what we've been sharing so far. It's going to be even different from the first Sunday morning that I shared. This is very strange for me uh, to just talk to a microphone. Um, but I'm also aware that this service and Thursday service, and to a degree Fridays, are much softer, more intense services than we usually have together anyway. And so tonight, I'm not going to expect you to read along with prayers, um, participate. Usually I'm begging you to do that. Um, we will do that on Easter. Um, but I'm going to try to replace what the essence of this service is uh, by speaking to you very much from the heart. Um, this service that we typically do on the Wednesday of Holy Week is a service of corporate confession and forgiveness. We have hymns, we have scripture reading, we have a dialogue, we have prayers. And then there's a tradition that's been long running in our congregation where we write down particular things we would confess and we bring them forward and those confessions are shredded um, as a sign of forgiveness. And then as a further sign that those forgiven sins are not remembered so that they could be pieced back together, I take them over to the parsonage uh, fire pit in the backyard and I burn them uh, to completely remove them. As the scripture says, God removes our sin as far from us as the East is from the West. Of course, remember that that was written before uh, an understanding of East meeting West it's not a lesson in geography, it's a lesson in God's grace. So tonight, I'm not able to gather with you and do the thing that we do after that. Because if you were to look at the bulletin that you would normally see, after the prayers of confession, the presentation of con confessions, examination of conscience, all of that, we hear the words of absolution and then there's a time of the laying on of hands. All the things that I've been called to do as a pastor in the church, um, this is one of the most humbling and the most um, intense for me. I have sat at the bedsides of the dying. I have stood at the gravesides of the grieving, with the grieving. I have said the body of Christ given for you thousands of times. I have baptized, I have married. But there's something quite profound about gathering with people and being called upon as a representative of the church, placing my hands on someone's head and saying these words, in obedience to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. I do that looking into the eyes as a person is ready to kneel and they bow their head for this proclamation. I see people, some of whom I know very well, some of whom I don't know as well, some of whom are twice my age, some of whom are much younger. I don't know their sins personally. Sometimes I do, but mostly it's a, a proclamation of, of understanding the general sin that we're all under. We Lutherans, we do corporate confession. We don't have a, a confessional booth where we enumerate specifics uh, to the priest. A reminder is that you are still allowed to do that with your pastor. Um, that confessional seal is still considered uh, sacred and, and um, confidential. Um, and if there's you know, someone you feel you need to talk to directly, I am supposed to be that person for you in addition to a, a support system of close friends, possibly a, a counselor. And I take this responsibility very, very seriously. And to proclaim that forgiveness, I take very seriously. So I wanna talk specifically about some things I wanna forgive you all of tonight, because I think we all need to hear it. I also wanna start with a bit of my own confession. Again, this feels strange talking to a camera. This feels like the reality TV confessional. That's actually what they call that on those shows. Uh, but I just, without becoming too personal or, or burdening you with, with, with that, I do want to say that in this very difficult time, I have been guilty 
of a lot of anger and a lot of rage. And some of you have seen a little bit of a glimpse of that in, in indirect ways. Um, when I grow frustrated uh, with the situation, live streaming difficulties, readjusting to what this will be like together, some of you see the little less censored Pastor Andy, and I think that's understood and forgiven. But on a deeper level, I harbor a lot of anger and rage right now as I want so badly for our nation, our world to come together to overcome the difficulty that we are facing. And where my anger and rage come out is when I am quite convinced that there are those who are making that difficult. And so I don't want to get into the personals of that or name names or, or make this about my particular point of view, subject you to that. But just to say that I'm recognizing in myself a lot of anger. And I spoke about the stages of grief and how we go through all of them. Um, and I'm angry at those who are still in denial. Let's just say it that way. Um, and I'm realizing that that's not serving much good. I still think it's important to advocate for sensible um, precautions in an environment when people are still denying that the situation is serious. Every day we get closer to un the, the reality that nobody can deny it anymore. Still the conspiracy theories rage on, the, 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 the refocusing of our attention. Um, it's maddening. And I have a lot of thoughts about that. But I also know that rage and anger undirected uh, are only harmful. They're only going to serve to further divide. They do not move us forward. When I wrote to you, uh, Congregation of United Lutheran, before Lent, I put in the newsletter that my goal every, every year as we approach Lent is to find a way to make Lent uh, constructive and transformative. And so I said that one of the things we need to abandon is shame. That confession is, is, it does not serve the purpose of shaming us because shame only leads us to despair and depression but that in our understanding of the law pointing us to our sin is so that we can amend and move on from it. The purpose of forgiveness is not to make the past not have happened. The purpose of forgiveness is to make the future brighter. And so I struggle with what forgiveness looks like. Um, can I forgive somebody that's harmed another? And what does it look like if they're not going to make amends or to resolve the situation as best they can? Is forgiveness held on to until certain conditions are met? As a human, that's how I operate. And yet I'm called as a representative of the body of Christ to speak of an unconditional love and forgiveness. And that's hard because when I pray the Lord's Prayer, and say, forgive us as we forgive others, I always pause and, and wonder if we are reading it ironically because I, I say that if God forgave the way I do, we'd be in a terrible mess because I'm terrible at forgiving. It's more of one of those prayers that as we prayed, it, 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 it reminds us to be forgiving like God is. I'm finding that very challenging right now and I'm also finding though that it's, it's not serving for me to be mad at a lot of people. Um, I'm not in a position to stop their behavior. I'm only in a, in a position to continue to advocate for the thing I said since day one, take this seriously. So there's my confession for you, is I've got a lot of rage, a lot of anger, and I want when this is all maybe not resolved, it's nothing's going to be exactly the same again. But as we begin to process into a new way of living together, um, whatever that's going to look like in, in six months, in a year, that we find a way to move forward together and that the, 
many and various sins of this time will not be permanent, do permanent damage to our relationship with one another. And that's what I do fear. And I'm looking at my own self when I worry about those divisions because I have um, spoken quite heatedly about certain folks that I just don't have the emotional time for right now. I confess that to you. Um, and so I ask for those words of forgiveness tonight, those words of healing, of hearing God's grace that serve as a, a mediation to move on. One of the most profound experiences of my ministry was when I took a few youth to a national youth gathering. It was all the way back in 2000. It was in St. Louis. And one of the speakers was Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa. One of the, the greatest um, living legends of, of religion, politics, public speaking, you name it. And he presided over um, his church in South Africa during the time of reconciliation after the end of apartheid. And he had been one of many to fight apartheid. Um, and when it ended, there was an expectation that the majority who had been held down uh, would turn violently on the minority that had held them down. And due to, but, but I should say, not and, but, due to the diligence of leadership like the church and Archbishop Tutu, there was not revenge. There were isolated incidents, of course, but there was not a widespread um, kind of uh, terror in reverse. The country of South Africa set up the Truth and Reconciliation Committee that served as a healing process. The only reason it worked, though, was because, I shouldn't say the only reason, but a key reason it worked, is because those who had been um, offenders were called out. They were, they were held to account. It wasn't that forgiveness means everything's fine now and we'll forgive and forget. It, it was a true reckoning, um, but not in a way that um, sought to simply live in the past, but a, a way that sought to move forward. And so I find myself knowing that I need to rely on the mercy of God to lead me into reconciliation when, when the time comes, because right now I'm, I'm not, uh, not in the best place for it. There's some, uh, some things that I want to give you uh, uh, some absolution for tonight then. You're probably not at your best right now. You're probably starting now to grow uh, more short-tempered than you were three weeks ago with the people you live with. The next three weeks are going to be even harder. Cut each other some slack. Live forgiveness to one another. The other thing I want to really focus on giving you forgiveness of tonight is something I'm seeing a lot in social media and it's, it's good advice. Stop listening to the people who say that this is your chance if you're quarantined to get really good at something or come out with six pack abs or you know, whatever, a perfectly clean house. Um, we are going through a collective trauma together and it's gonna be different levels for different people. For some folks, this is, they're able to weather this quite easily, and I'm really glad for those folks. For others, the reflected trauma of those they're trying to serve from afar um, is not so easy. Uh, for those who are suddenly without an income, this is getting really hard. We're all going through this at different levels, but it is a, a trauma in one way or another for all of us. And so if you're feeling the pressure to have it all figured out, to make sure your kids are still straight A students, whatever that looks like right now, uh, to try every recipe and go to housekeeping book or joy of cooking or whatever. Uh, you know, if you're getting joy from that, great, go for it. Achieve, build the biggest Lego tower you can, what, whatever, whatever gets you through. But don't feel like you've got to suddenly use this time to become better at everything or even two things, or even one thing. 
it's okay to not be great at it. It's okay to not be great at quarantine. And if we give our, each other the permission to not be great at everything, we're going to find ourselves forgiving each other a lot more. Um, there's a wonderful um, speaker who comes from the world of social work. I think I've quoted her once or twice in sermons before. Uh, she's a social work researcher. She's a Christian in background and, and in, in practice. Um, her name is Brene Brown, and she's uh, got a wonderful way of looking at things in, in life for all times, but especially in a time like this. And one thing that um, any good counselor would tell you uh, that, that they would advise their patients to do when they grow frustrated with the world is something that Brene Brown always encourages. If we were to treat everybody as if they were doing their best, just assume everybody you meet in whatever encounter it is, assume they're doing their best, because they probably are. And if it doesn't look like they're doing their best, then maybe their, be their best is really all they can muster right now. Have even more sympathy for that person, more empathy for that person. And if we were to approach each other with that kind of attitude, we'll find forgiveness to one to another and to ourselves, all that much more easy, not just easy, but real. And that's what this service has always been about. We come together to confess our sins. We name them individually and in secret, and we bring them to God for, for destruction. But then each of us hears those words from the pastor with the hands on the head. In obedience to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. I say to you who are sharing this time with me in whatever way now, whatever your sins, be they something I've already mentioned or something you can't bear to say out loud to another human being, give it to God. And in obedience to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you, yes, you, all your sins. May this Holy Week continue to draw us closer to God, and may we continue to draw closer to one another as the body of Christ.